Your hair looks beautiful today. Thank you. <laughs> You're so good to me. Jesus, Rob, you make my life so hard over here because how can I... Uh... You know who did not compliment my hair today? See? Um, I can only guess. (laughs) Every morning I wake up and I want to text you if you're going to call me beautiful today or do I have to text Rob? Wow. (laughs) I'll give you Rob's number. (laughs) Oh, my God. Start the show. (laughs) Well, hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Mike and I got Mr. Rob Chismark. Over there hanging in Middlebrook, Florida. This is another episode of The Sticky Side. Uh, we hope everybody is having a good time out there. Staying warm. We got the winter the winter storms coming down the East Coast. Did You you didn't get a taste of that one this week, did you, Rob? It's cold. That's about it. Yeah, we got like a, uh, an ice storm for a few hours and got everything white. I don't know. It started melting, what, about seven hours after it started. But... Oh, the we, only ice I ever get comes from my freezer. <laughs> yeah, one of the luxuries of living in Florida. Oh, and, and Friday. Why are yes, you looking at sir. me like that, Laura? I need you to fix your what? what um, my... microphone because the microphone stands all up in your face. I it's all up see in it. my grill. That's what I'm talking about. Good producing. I need new mic. You don't Just pay me for grill. nothing. Yeah, I got a way to pay you. Whoop! Stop. yeah but uh, what was i talking about oh yeah weather weather um friday we got another winter storm coming through rob (laughs) cancellations left and right i'm sorry i'm loving it well hey man um we are joined today by mr dave weiser an acl national director uh coming from us from ohio whereabouts in ohio you located uh dave uh just outside of cleveland Uh, up north up north how's the weather there um today it's not so bad but monday we got a foot of snow so uh, we're still ah! coming, we're still trying to get out of that <laughs> the snow mounds are high around here, that's for sure oh uh, well dave it's been a while man i think the last time i talked to you was probably uh 2015 and uh it was actually <laughs> it was actually on facebook messenger because when i went to send you the zoom link for this I, just, I was like, oh, we've talked before, and I scrolled up, and it was 2015, and we had a Facebook mm-hmm. um, chat going. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, what we, were we talking about? Oh, man, it had it was, to be cornhole. It was definitely <laughs> cornhole, man. It was uh, along the lines of uh, we were both still ACO commissioners at the time, and uh, I believe I asked you the question if you were staying on with the ACO or going to the new league, and I'm assuming the new <laughs> league was the ACL. <laughs> Interesting. I think man, you got you your can, answer. Yeah, interesting <laughs> what you can find in those chats, man, in the archives. <laughs> Seven years later, Seven years the later. answer is. <laughs> Rob, I'm going to have to go back and what check is... out some of our old messages. <laughs> what is the ACL? <laughs> oh, man. Was it even called the ACL in 2015? I, I don't think so. It's probably mm. called the ATL, yeah. American Tailgating League. The tailgating yeah. League. Well, thanks for joining us for Directors Month, uh, Dave. I uh, appreciate it. I know Rob, man, he he booked you. Uh, I was like, oh, Dave, you actually uh, came up in our conversation on our last show with Ryan LaBelle um, when we were talking about the old OG. And um, he actually shot me because I thought Ryan had been around for a minute, but he said that you were in it before he was. Uh, I may have been in it, but I thought he was running events before me. I don't know. I started running events kind of about... 2011 i think so yeah okay yeah he's he's what what do you say that's awesome man around 2009 or no he was like 2007 or 8 something like that yeah so he said he discovered it in seven went over to that bar yeah with those old crappy boards and and just started doing blind draws then <laughs> 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 unbelievable man yeah. you're, you're, saw a game and decided let me let me do something so you're a dinosaur dave been around for a minute Mm. time flies i tell you yeah, it, does. Yeah, it, does. <laughs> it, it seems like a long time ago but 10 years it's not that long ago right i don't know <laughs> some of the stuff it feels right. like it was just happened yesterday you know um but yeah 10 years does fly i just i need five more years to fly so i can go ahead and retire 
Wow. <laughs> yeah. When I first started playing with the ACL, it was um, one of my first events was the big event at the Cherokee Hotel and Casino there in in Cherokee, North Carolina. And it was the what was called Cobbs back then. And uh, Dave was all off in a room all by himself, just running some of the events. And we had some good conversation that day. And I was like, found out he was from, you know, my hometown or my home area. And so ever since then, I've been, you know, we've been able to have small talk as well as business talk. So um, Dave, one of the questions that you and I talked about uh, pre-show was what is the difference, you know, between being a successful local type director where you, you built an incredible league and an incredible following with Cleveland Cornhole. And then you decide, to take the step to become a national director what are the similarities and differences in local and national directing for you uh well first thanks for having me on guys this is uh my pleasure to be here um i mean there's a lot of similarities i'd say the biggest difference is uh, at the local level you know you get to know the players better you know you're you're with them all the time especially the diehards they're they're coming to every event, every league, every tournament you run, you know, and just just through that, you get to get to know them and learn a little bit about more about their you know, personal life and everything else. So there's more of a connection, definitely, with the players at the local level. Um, however, at the national level, you don't you don't necessarily get that right. You know, you you might see a player three or four times a year and chances are you're so busy, you don't have any time to to chat with them all right hey they, rob this is on you to get the fire back in the show let's go you got to get it now fire <laughs> what, I, what the hell's the matter with you <laughs> where's your energy you really, see guys you know, don't drink for a whole month get on my nerves i see? haven't had a drink in 20 <laughs> days man and all i've been eating is yeah, that, meat so i'm about to go pisses, crazy over here pisses me off <laughs> pisses me off how are you do, how are you even digesting the meat without alcohol it's called water <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's not working all right so all right back all right. to dave sorry <laughs> dave I, these technical difficulties i'm using some antiquated stuff it's the old server back in the uh beginning days of the acl i wasn't getting my text so <laughs> tell me tell me again local and national director and uh uh, you know, the differences and the similarities, then, and, and then I got a follow up question after that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think, I think there's more similarities than differences, but the, the number one difference is uh, local. You know, you get to, you get to know the players way much better. You know, you're around them several times a week. You know, I used, when I was running stuff, I was running two leagues a week and probably two or three tournaments a month. So, especially the diehards, they would come to everything, you know, they just, they just want to play bag. So just by default, by being there, you get to chat with them more and get to get to know them better. Whereas these nationals, you know, you, you go to, you see these people three or four times a year instead of three or four times a week. And chances are I'm so busy. I don't have time to chat with anyone anyway. So that that's the biggest difference. I think, you know, the personal aspect of it, but, the similarities are the same, you know. When I when I run an event, uh, my goal is to run as fair and fun events uh, as I can do, and whether that's a local tournament or a national tournament, and be as prepared as I can be for anything that might come up. You know, I I lost many nights of sleep just thinking about what well, what if this happens or what if this happens, you know, in the middle of the tournament, and for. For many years before the ACL software came around, I ran everything on paper, right? And and that was crazy. And then I finally bought into using the ACL software. And, but you know what? I still had that paper with me just in case. And then I started using the tablets because, you know, I wasn't sure how the tablets were going to work. And that made life easier. So I would say now, you know, running events is, is a lot easier. But that's a good thing because most events have grown into be so large that it's it would be impossible to run on paper anyway or 
you'd have to hire a whole crew to to help you through it. So I can see it, that a, a print my bracket with two hundred teams on it, and you have to do it on a poster <laughs> board or something. How much of a pain in the ass would that be? <laughs> it would be, but I used to, you know, I had all print. I printed it out from three team brackets up to like sixty four, I think, back in the day when I ran them on paper and. I'd still run seven tournaments, two advanced, two competitive, two intermediate, and a blind draw. It was all done on paper. Everyone reported their games, you know, individually. You had to call out every game over the loudspeaker. It it was crazy. Life life today as a director is much better than it used to be, as long as you have good Wi-Fi. Hey, Rob. <laughs> ah, I like that. Shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, he goes to Pet Spot and I, buys a hamster to run on a wheel for his internet connection. How many of those things do you good go news, though, when I Good news, though. When I go to my events, though, it's uh, it's uh, always good Wi-Fi. I go to very good uh, <laughs> venues. So they always have very good Wi-Fi for me. So everything runs very smoothly. Well, whatever you like did, it. it's working now. Like, perfect. I didn't do anything. I just uh, unplugged it and plugged it back in. You know the old faithful way. <laughs> <laughs> the, the customer service way. <laughs> Every time you call them. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm going to get a new modem. So I, I got to do something. I knew I, knew I had to boost this stuff and just stupid. So stop, again, I apologize. Stop finishing seventh, man, in your tournaments and you can win some money and you could upgrade your internet. I hate you. <laughs> Come on. I should just do what you do and retire. Man, actually, I got four more years. <laughs> if, then I don't. If I can retire. Then I don't. <laughs> Then I don't finish anywhere. I could just talk about people not finishing up higher than seven. That's that's Jeez. what I retired. You know, when I used to play, I used to be, you know, one of the best. And then everyone got better. So I'm just like, you know what? I need to focus on running events. They'll never know that. It's stuck. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but then, Dave, you don't have like any videos on YouTube of you making all these incredible shots, you know, that you know you have in you. Uh, you don't have any social media. Come on, man. You got to come back. Play. <laughs> uh there's there's still one video from back in the day i still watch every once in a while I'm like, yeah see i used to know how to throw a bag <laughs> not anymore and we've talked about what? this before on the show but there's like i all these shots that you see some of these pro players making on youtube on esp and i'm like i did that in the tournament a blind draw more, more than twice nobody yeah. saw it though <laughs> when i play when i play there was no such thing as a roll bag what's, what's a roll bag uh, yeah that's that's new right. to me too that's you that airmail or you black lucky that was a lucky yeah. shot man. right yeah yeah, yeah. Right. dave i get like at least an email a month from you when it comes to player levels and that's one of the things that i feel like you are it's kind of like a peeve of yours did that come from all the years of watching those people grow around you in the cleveland area as they just got better and better because i know you had your leagues are like a league and B league and C league and and you don't necessarily use the 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 nomenclature that is used in the ACL for your leagues or when you were running them. So is that is that player level thing? Is that something that you do because of is that a is that a peeve of yours because of what you saw? I don't know if it's a peeve. I'm just you know like I said when I run events, I want them to be as fair as possible, right? And I don't think anybody likes a sandbagger. You know, nobody, nobody wants to right, go to a tournament right. and, and sign up for intermediate and watch some guy, you know, making three out of four every round. That That's not fun for anyone. It's not fair for anyone. Um, yeah. When I, when I was running leagues, we used to have, you know, we'd have 60 teams in a league and I would split it into like seven divisions or something, you know, groups of eight basically, but it wasn't based on the data because we didn't, we didn't, weren't using tablets or anything like that for the leagues. So it was just more based strictly on results. And, you know, if you won your division, guess what? You're moving up. It was as simple as that. Now we have this database with the ACL with 30, 40,000 people. We, we want the regional directors, conference directors, even local directors to, to do as much as they can as far as weeding out, you know, players that are marked wrong uh, or are clearly not playing in the right division. But And there, I think most of the regional directors are doing that, but not all of them. And I spend, you know, Sunday night comes and Monday night after a weekend of regional conference opens, lots of data comes in right over the weekend. 
and I'll spend two hours Sunday night, two hours Monday night, just digging into everything that's come in um, and, and look at it. And I, I have a whole set of reports that, that come out of that, including, you know, PPR is the, the most popular one, right? Points per round. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't tell the whole story. Just because your points per round is advanced level, I'm not going to go in there and say, well, you know, you're throwing 8.2. I'm moving you up. No, I take that. And then I look and see, how did you do? What, what tournaments have you been playing in? Where did you finish? What level did you play? You know, and if you're you're throwing 8.2 and you're playing competitive in Florida, you know, like, you know, depending what part of the country you're in, you know, if you're in Florida or Ohio, you're probably playing against good competition, right? And if you're playing competitive and finishing seventh, I'm not going to say, oh, you need to move up just because your PPR is 8.2. So you kind of got to weigh both things and the same with the regional directors. But, you know, I'd say 90, 95 percent of the people that I move on my own. It's just they never took the time to go into their player profile and say, I'm an advanced player. They they signed up two years ago. They marked it as intermediate. No one's ever changed it. They weren't intentionally sandbagging. They're already playing advanced. But just trying to clean that up, um, that's been more of this year's focus. And then I send a lot of these reports to all the regional and conference directors so that they can look at them too because they don't have access to all this, right? So... If someone's on the bubble, I might send an email to you, Rob, or somebody that say, what do you think about this guy? You think you think he should be moving up? The data kind of shows he should move up, but not quite sure. So how does uh, yeah, how does that work for someone coming from another organization like the ACO um, and they come over to the ACL? and they don't have a PPR with the ACL. How do you, is that just like a, a judgment, like a voting process you would do like with yourself and the other directors? That's, I mean, the first couple tournaments they play in, it's strictly based on what the regional director would know, whatever event they're playing in. You know, if, if I'm running a Cleveland regional and I know there's a ACO pro coming and playing ACL for the first time and he signs up for intermediate, I mean, it should be obvious, right? And I would yeah. call them out on it and try to move them. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you run a regional, somebody walks in off the street. If somebody walks off in off the street in Cleveland and to play in their first ACL tournament, says, I've never played in a coronal tournament before, I'm going to say you should play intermediate because even intermediate in Cleveland's pretty darn good. And if they show up and they just roll through them, okay. I mean, it is what it is. Nobody knew. They didn't know. So it's like I'm going to move them up immediately. You know, they, they ran through an intermediate, you're competitive now, there's there's no looking back. But I'd say that's, at least in, in my area, that's pretty rare to walk in the, off the street and start throwing eights, you know, or, or whatever they were doing to roll through intermediate. So there's no, that that's kind of one of the downfalls, but if there's no information on someone, what what else can you do? It's just, it's going to happen. My, my theory is you can roll through it once, but... If we don't move, if the director doesn't move you up, it's shame on the director. They should have moved you up right away, you know, yeah. so that it doesn't happen again. You get you get to do it once, and hopefully, you just it's just you didn't know better, or the director didn't know you, so it's it's legit. I really do try to. Uh, I keep my intermediate as clean as possible. I try to keep guys down there that are, you know, really competing because they want to be there competing, but they they just don't have the skill to be in competitive, and and I get, man, you should, it's a grind because these people are, they get, they get crazy when you move them up. You know, I, I, when in intermediate, you can win for me, you can win one time. So you can win one time in doubles or you can win one time in singles. And I'm moving you to competitive because it's time for you to go play somewhere else. Uh, and it's just, you just get, I get hammered. You know, these people cry for days and they want to go and cry to the next, the next level director and they want to, they just, they just want to stay down. And I don't know if they just want to win. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's money because the payout isn't huge, but I, I think they just want to feel good about themselves more. You know, uh, they're not ready to work hard to be in that next level. And then boy, when I let, I let competitive players win twice. So either one event in either one or two events in one, it doesn't matter which, but so if they win both singles and doubles that month, I'm moving them to advance. And then they're like, but my PPR, I'm like, I know, but you just rolled through. You, you know, you had a great day. Maybe I'll let you have one more month, but golly, you're killing everybody. You know, so it's such a, uh, there's, 
with the ACL from its onset, there has not been some sort of roadmap to when people have to move. So we get we get all those debates and all that whining, I like to call it, crying. I don't even know what else you want to call it, but mm -hmm. but you get all that when because there's no real roadmap. So watching you kind of do it from afar and you're re really able to concentrate on all that because of, you know, you're kind of away from the local stuff, uh, being able to control that. And when that spreadsheet comes out, I kind of, I'll take that and show it to that player that made it. But typically I don't have very many people on that spreadsheet from my region, but when they do make it, I screenshot it and send it to them and say, listen, this came from the league. Obviously you're performing at a higher level than the level that you're playing. So I got to move you. And they're, they're usually like, Oh, uh, well, I was planning on moving anyway, but you know what I mean? So yeah. what, what has that been like over, over time? Because you are a lot like me. What has that been like for you to just move those people? How many, how many cries and arguments and, and all that. I know, I think it was you one time that told me when somebody said, I've never won anything in competitive. And, and then I think you told me to ask him, well, what did you win in, in novice, you know, cause I never played novice. So, you know, so that was kind of an argument. I think it might not have been you. It could have been Trey or somebody else, but uh, what is that like for you though? What has that been like for you? And how did you deal with those crying people, <laughs> crying people? Well, well, like I say, I mean, everything that I'm doing here is data driven, so I can always back up my decision and, and I'm, I'm more than happy to have a discussion with a director or even a player about it. And they, they can plead their case and I'll, I'll try to be as fair as I can, or, you know, bring other people in and get their opinion as well. But I'm just to be completely honest with you, there have not been that many complaints and I move up, I've moved up thousand plus people this year. Now, like I said, <laughs> Like I said, 95% of them just probably their accounts were marked wrong. They were already playing at a higher level. They just, their accounts re reference something lower. But as we move on through the season, I've caught a lot of those already. So now the ones that I'm moving are more, you know, based on results. Yeah. But from my experience locally, you know, there, there's two, diff two types of players, right? There's the one who, who's there to try and get better. Heck, they'll play up even though they're intermediate, they'll go and play in advance, right? Uh, if, you know, if we let them at, at the regional level, we do. And because they just want to get better, they challenge themselves. And then there's others who will never move up until you absolutely force them to. Right. So both both ends of the spectrum. And then there's a couple that, you know, they'll keep playing. It'll, I've had a couple at the lower level playing intermediate and saying, you know, when, when are you going to move me up? When are you going to move me up? And I'm like, hey, I'm letting you play there until you win one. You know, I'm. I'll move you up if you want me to. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm letting you have the option to keep, you know, you keep finishing fifth or something, you know, you're fifth out of 30, you're doing really well. You just can't get over that hump. But so we've had all, all different kinds of uh, reactions, but I'd say for the most part, I have not received a ton of bad reactions. In fact, a lot of the people I move, I'm getting feedback from directors saying, thank you. Thank you. Now I can say it came from headquarters. <laughs> And not for me. And it's just a fact. I'm, <laughs> I'm using the data. I'm using the data. And the data says, you know what? If I moved you, it was clear you should be moved up. If you're on the bubble, we'll have that discussion. My final response is, if you get moved up, it's not permanent. You know, I'm saying you need to go, if you're a competitive player and you get moved up, and you go play advance like three or four times and you get run over, come back to me. We'll talk about it. We can move, we can always move you back down. Now, if we move you back down, it's going to be a really short leash, right? You win, you come move down and you win the next one. Guess what? You're going right back up. But getting run over is how you get better. That's how you, I, these people that want to stay in competitive or uh, intermediate or, or whatnot, that amazes me because when I came back, um, you know, I hadn't played competitive competitively in a tournament for about, two and a half years. So I messaged Trey Ryder and was like, Hey man, I want to play at worlds. Um, where can I go? And he put me in, um, competitive and I was like, damn, man, I don't want to play in competitive. I want to play in advance. That's where all my boys are. That's everybody I know back from the day is an advanced or a pro. And I know I can play with them. And, um, you know, he, he put me in competitive. I played, 
Um, and another thing that sucked about playing competitive was it, it was on a Tuesday. And, you know, all the people, <laughs> all the people didn't get there till like, Thursday and Friday, so I didn't get a chance to see anybody. But anyway, except for Rob, of course. And, uh, you know, I went, like, 5-2 and two in competitive. And um, the ones that put me out, man, were – pro level players i'm telling you <laughs> or at least high advanced players i played this one girl she didn't miss a bag and uh so there, there's a mix in that competitive that should be up anyway but these people don't want to sit and sandbag and stay in competitive and, and you know i just don't get that well, why are they playing the game if they're not trying to better themselves or you know try to make pro eventually yeah and those are never going to be perfect especially at world some people will only like they won't play ACL all year. Um, we're trying to limit that maybe a little more going forward. But And then come to Worlds because they just want to be a part of that atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, they'll play competitive and roll roll through it. And, you know, for some events like Worlds and Opens, you know, if you win a lower event, it's an automatic move up. You know, that's, that's one of the reports I run every Sunday night, Monday, too. It's like, oh, we just had an Open and you played intermediate singles and you won. Well, you're not intermediate anymore. I don't even look at anything else. It's an automatic, <laughs> it's an automatic move up. In worlds, it's not just the winners. You know, it might be the top five or, or something. So, we just but, had a an incident here in Florida. You know, we had a player who, uh, by all intents and purposes, should have been an advanced player. He had won two competitive division in 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 consecutive months. He won competitive uh, at a particular regional, which is pretty well, you know. It's got it's got a pretty good competitive division, and I believe you must have been the one who moved him up, and he moved up, and then he went. This kid went on a tirade and complained, and said, "You know, I, I'll never play this game again." F this. He posted stuff on Facebook, whatever this, that, and the other. And I guess no. three days later, they figured it out and they put him on back to competitive. He goes to the open here in Florida, and now they they're doing a little different this year where. It's it's not completely open with the, the blind draws, but the blind draw was Friday night. He registered in the competitive blind draw, and guess what happened? Yeah, you guessed it. He won the damn thing. And so I looked at him, and I, I walked right over to him. I looked at him and said, you cannot complain anymore. There's no, there's nothing left for you. You went to a blind draw in the competitive division and won. I said, I, I don't care or what your PPR was, you won. You won an open event, 210 teams, so 410 people. You know, yeah, there was competitive and advanced, different levels of blind draw, but the dude won. So I don't – I just – I thought it was – I just – man, it was one of those things that just make you shake your head. And I didn't have any involvement with them before he started complaining because he came and complained to me because I'm the state director here in Florida. So he came and complained to me first and then i just told him they must have moved you for a reason it's all i you know and he told me about all his wins and i was like well i think you're in the right place then so now he's won a competitive blind draw at an open so there you are that's one of your one of your things that move people automatically so yeah, hopefully that'll and, happen <laughs> and, and really you know when i was running events here i i got more complaints from other players about other players you know than when I move them up, when I move somebody up, yeah. there'd be a, there would be a pl- complaint once in a while, but usually it's if I did move sure. someone up is when I got more complaints. Like what, what's this guy still doing playing competitive? But hmm. it, there's no full. It is, those way, are great but questions, better. but right. Is there a foolproof way? That's, that was one of my other questions for you. Is there, I mean, we have all, all this data now. So is there something that we can end up making like, that there will be a roadmap. Is there something like that coming? Uh, do you see that in the future? I, I could see something getting closer to, you know, su- suggestions. I mean, we have suggestions, but there's still a lot of directors not using tablets. So we're still missing lots of data. And then, you know, there's still, it would have to be a combination of PPR results. Um, Cause if you look at certain areas of the country, you know, their advanced level might be throw in seven, 7.5 PPRs, that's really competitive level, but they're the best in their area and they go somewhere else and they're going to get run over. So it, it would have to be a combination of things, but until we get everyone collecting all the information, we're not, we're not going to get there. 
Are you the only and, ACL I'm national sorry. director? No, I mean, it's a title. I I mean, I don't even consider that a big, the main part of my job anymore, even though it's ACL national director. It's more like data analyst. <laughs> you know, I'm going, I'm going to two or three of the pro nationals. I'll be helping run those and I'll be at worlds helping to run that, but you know, three or four events, you know, it's, there are others. Josh, Josh Keck is running all the opens. He'll, he'll be at all the nationals. He's everywhere. And then, uh, Todd Kosicki is kind of the director of directors. He's considered a national director. So there's three of us by title right now, but Josh is doing, you know, most of that work traveling okay. around the country. I, I've, I, I look at it as I put in my time. I had to, I had to work through, you know, world events where I sat in that room by myself, as Rob said <laughs> earlier with we, before tablets, you know, hundreds, we, you know, we had, we had nationals that had 800 people. Everyone had to report all their wins or losses. And it, it was just chaos. So it, it shaved a few years off my life, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but don't you hate it now? Because um, when you're running tournaments, people don't have to report to you. So that's less people you have to meet. Don't you like meeting all these players? And <laughs> <laughs> At nationals, I just look forward. <laughs> I just look forward to making it through a day like, at regionals well regionals got to be the point where i just look forward to making it through the day too but when it was a little smaller it was a little it was more fun just because it, it wasn't as stressful yeah. and you got to chat more but once it got big it did it doesn't matter there's i just want to get through it <laughs> you've gotten rid of cleveland cornhole is that correct you have you've, you've uh, moved on from there i still have a small part in it but for the most part i'm not involved at all with day-to-day operations so yes are you still running regionals though because you had said something about regionals no i helped them with one so far this season i stopped at the end of last year i kind of handed it over i i ran one with them watching and then the the second last or the last one of the year they ran and i watched and that was it i i've helped them with one this year because one of the two guys was out of town so but no i haven't i haven't haven't really been involved since about May and I've, I've fully enjoyed it. <laughs> I bet. I, I bet. I mean, you got all the other things going on with the kids with dance, right? And dance and band, the two things that it's a, uh, you, your children are involved in now. Yeah. Dance and cheer. And then they're on in the band, but they're part of the dance team on the band. So it's dance. And it's been, right. so I ran cornhole for almost 10 years. I played cornhole for three years prior to that, which I was a diehard, like, you know, diehards are. I was playing four or five times a week. And then before I started running cornhole, I was playing uh, as kind of a second job for income. I was playing online poker for seven years. So, <laughs> wow. so for the last, the last 15, 20 years, my nights have not been free. So this last six months have been awesome. <laughs> uh, I can go, I can go do what I want, make my own schedule where I haven't done that in a long time. I swear, I wish that back about 10 years ago, the cornhole world is like it is now because that, well, seven to 10 years ago, because that's, I was like you, Dave, you know, three nights a week, man, I was going to blind draws every weekend. I was either running a tournament or playing in one. And, um, you know, the older you get, man, you just lose that, you know. (laughs) I've lost the motivation to go to three blind draws every night. And back then I was married, but then maybe that's why I did it. So I could get out of the house. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, yeah, the mode, the motivation <laughs> faded for two reasons for me. Yeah. One is that, that other, the other organization, I won't, you know, won't talk about too much here, but mm-hmm. they, they put in some roles I thought were horrendous and it kind of killed my desire, but drove my desire to make things better in the cornhole world. Yeah. Um, but not, but as a player, it kind of killed it. And then once I started running things and, uh, the league started growing and tournaments started growing, I realized I couldn't play and run them as well as I wanted to. I couldn't, I definitely couldn't play as well because I was focused on too many other things and I couldn't run at the event as well as I wanted to, if I was out there playing. So I just decided I had to pick one or the other. And I, I decided to focus on running events. And by doing that, my skill level just dropped and then when i do pick up a bag now i just get frustrated so people ask me do you, do you miss it and i'm like no because when i throw a bag now it doesn't go where i tell it to go so it's not fun 
it's muscle yes. memory. It'll it'll take a little bit, but it comes back. And um, yeah. you know, you, you're it'll talking about you're talking about the other organization, of course, it's the ACO. But you know, me and you, we were both commissioners back in there, back when that first started. I mean, we both started out as certified officials, and you know, you were one before me. Then uh, they got this commissioner thing going, and you know. Right along the time where you left is when I started feeling like it's time to go because of what you were leading to was like some of the things that they were implementing. And it my downfall over there was, you know, it was the beginning of the ACL. A lot of players started going to the ACL from the ACO. And then I got put in charge of Kentucky as the commissioner. And I'm sitting over here <laughs> in North Carolina saying – <laughs> what the hell am I going to do from North Carolina to help be the commissioner <laughs> in Kentucky? And um, I actually, I would message the guys and be like, hey, how's it going over there in Kentucky? How's your regionals going? And everybody was nice. I made a little Facebook group. But I knew that was my demise in the ACO hierarchy right there. It was time to go. Um, I enjoyed running the tournaments. So I'm sure like you did. You know, met a lot of people that way. And um yeah, that's. I mean, it's the only thing I miss since giving up Cleveland Cornhole is seeing the people. And mm -hmm. I, I've made a couple spot appearances. Like I said, I helped run one regional, and uh, a couple times I've been called to go sub at at a league, you know, play, not not run it, but sub and throw bags. Mm -hmm. So I got to you know hang out with some people there. I can always go see them, but not not seeing them three or four times a week is the biggest negative to giving up Cleveland Cornhole. But but overall, I'm I'm enjoying my my freedom from being locked down Monday night, Thursday night, and several Saturdays a month. Uh, did did you come into the ACO <laughs> as a director? How did you start? Like how did you put your foot yeah, in the, the door? The move to being a national director is that a move that you would make again? I mean, is that one of the? Are, are you are you happy with that one? Oh no! Oh yeah, yeah. There I go kinda... again. <laughs> uh oh. Uh, yeah, so I, I have no regrets. Oh, um, man. Uh, to answer to answer the other question, how did I get involved? I, yeah, like how'd you problems. get your foot in the door in the ACL? Yeah, I mean, I reached out to uh, this. This is kind of my standing joke, right? I think it was 2011. He was running ATL, American Tailgating League, and running not just cornhole, but all those other games. Floops. And he was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was, yeah. he was running all kinds of, he was running a big Vegas event, and, uh, I, I think people know, you know, Adam Hissner won that one. I think it's probably like a ten thousand dollar prize or something. And it was the same weekend as the ACO Worlds. Well, I'm like, I'm going, I'm going to Vegas, but but my dad passed away, the same right before it, so I didn't get to go to either one. Oh, man. But I reached out to him, and I'm just like, you know, how can I, how can I help? You know, I just want to, I just want to grow cornhole. I just want to make it better and as big as possible. And you know, we had some chats going back and forth. And and my standing joke is, man, this this chick knows what she's doing. You know, I didn't know, it was, I didn't know Stacy was a guy. <laughs> me was, too. Me too. It was just me email. Too. <laughs> it was just email back and forth, Stacy Moore. So I assumed it was a she, but obviously mm -hmm. it wasn't. But, you know, I just offered to, to help whenever I could. Uh, he's, he ran another one in Greensboro, North Carolina. I don't, maybe you were there. I don't know. Um, that I said, hey, just, just give me a hotel room. I'll come down. I'll run the whole cornhole part of it. I don't know anything about any of those other games, but cornhole is going to be your biggest event anyway i'll run the cornhole so yeah, i did that it's been main gate back then yeah, when it was main gate or whatever that was called. mega gate yeah mega, mega so, gate there you go so the one there was obviously there's no technology back then there's i mean there's no software there's no tablets no nothing everything was done on paper and about halfway through the tournament he's like well the live band's going to start up so you're not going to be able to use the microphone anymore i'm like how in the world do you call out games if they can't hear you? <laughs> so halfway through the tournament, I lose my microphone, you know, and you just try to keep players as close as possible to, to get them out there. But yeah, that was the first one I helped run them. And then, uh, you know, Cherokee, I offered to help run those. I'm like, give me a hotel room. I'll come help run those. He, I get, got put up in the event room. We had two separate rooms in Cherokee and kind of uh, <laughs> fended for myself up there for a year. And then the next year I was in the other room and, you know, basically I just, I just offered up my help uh, and Stacy was willing to, to give it a shot. And for the most part, it worked out and here I am still yeah. with them and things are, 
exploding have exploded <laughs> still kicking hell i i left before you then i think i think i left the aco before you no nah, he, he he left first because yep. because you were you were still in it and dave was gone i mean most of cleveland was gone well, in uh two 2004 2015 no, yeah, 2016. You're right. You're right. You were still there in 16. Yeah. And Dave was long gone. Yeah, you kind of left when Frank Maudlin went over there, and yeah, with Hisner and Cody Henderson and them. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah. I yeah, I think I think Cleveland Cleveland was the first one of like the first year there were like eight the eight directors running regionals, and Cleveland was one of the first eight. So yeah. Which is why you know on the very first big broadcast, the July 4th broadcast they have every year, you know. Of the 16 players that were there, like half of them were from Cleveland because yep. we we had one of the only followings. So, mm-hmm. um, but then obviously it just took off from there everywhere. That's freaking awesome, man. That's it's a, that's cool. I always wanted to ask you what happened because I remember like Cleveland was huge uh, because I started with the ACO back way back. Well, I say way back, but uh, and Cleveland was huge with Christine being like the the top woman player and you know they like uh ken allen was pretty good at in the ace you know on the aco level and cleveland was just a big spot chucky love doing his thing and and then and then all of a sudden it was like everybody vanished and i always wanted to get uh the story uh what what it was but just like you said you know some regulations were coming in and you were like I got to get out of here. <laughs> so that that was, well, uh, that's, that's crazy. They all, they all came with me. I mean, yeah, you know, there were, yeah. there was one or two years where I would run an ACL regional and I would just throw in a quick ACO regional before it because there were, there were like eight players that still wanted their ACO points, but that, that quickly faded. Eventually they quickly all just came over just to play ACL. But yeah, Stacia, Christine and Stacia were the two best women They dominated everything for a while. We still have, I mean, Adam and Trey Birchfield, they live about an hour, hour and a half from Cleveland. Did Stacia and Christine, did they they retire from playing? Uh, They're not. No, Christine's Christine's a pro still. Oh, okay. Um, But Stacia did. Stacia retired from playing uh, maybe two years ago. She's a heck of a chess player now, though. <laughs> she's a she's a heck of a chess player and teacher. She's she's loving what she does, so it's a good thing. Uh, good for her. I tell you, who's making noise out of Cleveland right now is old Chucky Love. Chucky seems to have raised his game again lately. Yeah, he's what I thing. just saw a post from uh, Trey Ryder. He's what in the top ten right now on points. Thank you. And he's won a couple yeah. senior opens, which had you know had all the had Damon there and others. So it's it's good. He he. He's always been a great player, just always been right on the edge. So maybe this is his year. Maybe. I'm oh, a big, yeah. big Chucky Love fan, man. I, I remember back in the day, we'd go out to the smoking area and Chucky would be out there smoking and, and we'd have some good conversations, man. He's funny. He's a character. Still a diehard. I, you know, you play that long, you got to think that over time your desire has to fade at some point. So I give, I give props to those who can still play at that level for this long a period of time. Man, it's crazy. I couldn't do it. Ooh, crazy. <laughs> I just don't have time. I wish I had the time. You know, you know what, Dave? That's why all these kids are good nowadays. That's all they do. That's all they do is throw bags. They're, they're not adults. They don't have to, you know, work and provide. You know what I'm saying, Rob? See, if you weren't so busy, Rob, and had yeah. to provide, you'd be better. And, <laughs> and, they'd all, and they've all given up their other their extracurricular sports, too. They've all yeah. – they, they're concentrating on cornhole where they used to play baseball, basketball, and football, and they're not anymore. So it's crazy, man. It's But it's awesome. It's awesome for the game. It is. Yeah. And I don't hate it. I do like I do like the new rule of, you know, only 18 people or only eight people under the age of 18. I think that's great, you know, that in the pro division. But, you know, when you're not in the pro division, you're in the advanced division, these kids are just tearing you up and giggling. Man, they don't even they don't even care. You can't even cuss at them the you, right You can't way. talk smack to them. It's not fair. <laughs> it is not fair, Rob. No, but they, if I'm playing beside a 12-year-old and he's boy, talking smack, talk smack, I can't say anything. I just hold my mouth because know, if I crazy. say something, I'm going to have parents behind me looking at me like I'm going to kick his ass or something like that. Yeah. You know? Well, Laura wants to say get, something. However, yeah. like if 
<clears throat> you are a child in a room full of adults playing an adult game in an adult league. <clears throat> You're signing yourself up to get cussed at. And you just need to have that experience. That's what toughens you uh, up, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like there is nothing inappropriate about that. You wanted to be here. You wanted to play the game. You wanted to compete. You're going to get cussed at. Okay. Well, here, you, you try this. Trying you stand, to win my $10. You stand beside a 12-year-old that just dropped like three, four baggers in a row on you, scored like 12 points, and turn around and look at him and call him a little shit and see how that flies at a cornhole tournament. You're gonna have parents throwing bags she's at you. Pretty. In fists. She'll get she'll get away with it. She's pretty. <laughs> We're not she getting away with it. <laughs> Rob, did you forget who you're talking about? She doesn't watch my games. Wow. She she of would all. not see what's going on. That's because she didn't want to cuss <laughs> it out the twelve year old. <laughs> yeah. I'll be that like sideline Karen. Like if there's some twelve year old whooping your ass, I'm gonna say something about it. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna say something like, "Damn, Mike, you suck." Pick, pick <laughs> it up, Mike. The bags go in the hole. Uh, yeah, but you know, <laughs> you, nobody likes to lose to a kid, man. Come on, you, if you're a uh -huh. grown ass man and and you were playing, Rob, before some of these kids were born, like you were playing when some yeah. of them were still in diapers, and now they're putting it right. on your ass. Nobody likes to lose like that, but you know. Their their bones the are, their, of our game, though. Yeah, 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 I mean yeah. It, it is, it is. But I still, mean, you don't look like at it. those other sports. These kids, <laughs> these kids, their chances of making, you know, the NBA or the NFL are minuscule, right? And right. I mean, the way the pro division is going now, it's getting harder and harder, obviously. But they're proven that they can keep up with the pros, and you know, million dollar prize pots and big the question sponsors is, though, who knows will they be able to do it you know once they hit that 18 21 year old you know they're doing it now and they're 12 15 16 are they going to be able to do it when they get to 18 21 year old range at the same level because you know that's what we were just talking about chucky being at it and being good at it for a long time you know kids and their in their mind when they do have to go to work when they do have to go to school what what's it going to be like so you know it's great to watch that division grow and be so successful and so powerful now but what happens to these kids when they become adults? Well, first off, we haven't uh, really seen that yet. Well, first off, they got to get between the ages of fourteen and eighteen. That's when the puberty <laughs> right. kicks in, and that's when oh, I like I like girls, I like boys. You know, that's when that kicks in. Right. If they can survive right. that and still play cornhole, then hey, they're destined to be great cornhole players. But I've <laughs> seen I've seen great kids that were awesome throwers younger, and then they hit those teens. Girls right. just blew their minds, and you don't even see them anymore. They don't even play bags anymore. And they were good players, right. man, as kids. So, Kobe, Kobe McKeever, he's one of those guys. I don't know if girls did it or he just found uh, other interests, but he was one of those guys that was incredible. Yeah. You well, know? He, was, uh, he could do things with bags back then that other people couldn't do. I mean, he had two different spins on his bag. Yeah. You know? So, well, yeah. Not, not just Kobe. Remember Bobby Morris Jr.? Bobby Morris yep. Jr. was the first, like, small kid that everybody right. in the cornhole well, DK, nation. DK was the first. Well, how old was Derek when he started? I think DK was the first young. Yeah. 10. I think he was 10 when he played Matt in the in the oh. world championship. Okay, yeah, because I think Bobby Morris Jr. was probably 9 or 10. 10 or 11. Yeah. But um, he was little, so yeah. so we liked him more. <laughs> and, and he had the he had the flat ass bag, and he would spin the bag on his finger. And at ten years old, and he was the first person that I know about. DK, maybe he, maybe um, uh, Bobby Morris Jr. is the second person, but he would get all the accolades around the country for being as small as he is and playing the way right. he did. Um, but he disappeared. I mean, I've seen pictures of him on Facebook. He's no longer. Little Bobby, you know, he's, he's grown up nah. now. Uh, um, but yeah, it, it's funny. Some of these um, kids just disappear when they hit those teens, man. They do, man. They find other interests. That's why, I mean, like Dave, your surrogate son, I like to call him Eric Anderson. He's been at it since he was a young guy. Um, and he's really still young, but he's been at it for a long time. You've watched him grow up in this game and it's, it's awesome to see him do what he's doing now. At this age, we didn't know Eric as a young kid because he really only played ACL. But 
he's been at it for a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, he, he keeps he always tells me a story. I showed up in your league, and you know he was in Division Four or something when he first started. But right, he rose up pretty quickly. I mean, Trey Birchfield, he oh yeah, he's he's the example from here that I would say he when he was real young, uh, real young, like eleven or twelve. You know, he used to come to a tournament once in a while, and he'd probably been like an intermediate player. Then then I didn't see him for like three years, and he came back and was this machine at like age fifteen. <laughs> so yeah. he, he's obviously the rare case where now he's he travels the country and plays cornhole but uh so just it's yet to see how many can actually accomplish that go from the you know the 10 11 year old to 18 and still be doing it at a high level but we'll see what happens yeah jamie graham was one of those that he he was 15 when he started playing in my regionals and you know jamie back when he first started playing with us uh he was like an intermediate player you know, he was one of them guys that could – you expected to beat him. But he would have one of them games where you would be like, oh, shit, Jamie's on fire, you know. Um, but he went through his teens, and uh, from 15 to 16, I don't know what happened, but he flipped a switch, man. He came back after a year and turned into a, a machine. But he's a good example of somebody that's, you know, started playing and didn't lose focus when they got through their teens. So, yeah, and I think a lot's going to come with you know we're trying to develop ACL high school and ACL college. If if those get rolling and growing like crazy, that'll keep more people interested. You know, at that age until they get out of those and you know into the adult league or whatever you want to call it. But um, if those if we can get those to be more successful, then it'll keep more kids interested and bring more into the game. What well, well, tell they won't. Tell us about that. What is that high school program? Is just ACL uh, people going out there and just having curriculum with the high schoolers, the students playing cornhole after school or something? Or yeah, I think it's gonna. I think it's being led led by uh, Len Len Hyatt. Is that yes, sir. Out, out in the northwest, so he's leading that up. Uh, it's just getting started. So they just they had high school as part of their college event uh, over New Year's. Uh, it's kind of a kickoff, I guess. Um, and they're going to try to feature it more at Opens, have like a high school division. I'm sure it's going to start small, but you got to start somewhere, right? And, you know, mm-hmm. if we can start getting into schools, schools bringing the kids, kids play, they start coming to regionals. It's, you know, the sky's the limit, but you have to start somewhere. So I mean, it's just kind of getting started. Yeah. The ACL started with floops. Floops and <laughs> was it beer pong? Uh, and then what was the other? There was a cornhole board, but it had different holes in it. Remember that one? Uh, yeah, the ACL when they first started, or ATL, I think they had a five point slot in the back, too. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, they did. I asked them to bring that back. I had a conversation with Stacy, I want that back. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how you ever intentionally got in the it was just like luck, I think, but it was there. I, I saw started. Matt Guy playing a cool game a couple of months ago on one of his live feeds. It was a baseball game. Did you see that? I did mm-hmm. not. No, it was a giant cornhole board, and the holes were bases. You had, like, first base, second base, uh, third base, and home home run slot. And, um, yeah, you played baseball like that. And if you didn't hit it in a hole, put the bag in a hole, it was an out. Um, wow. Yeah, it looked like it was fun, man. Different aspect of the game, different way to play it. Maybe one day they'll make one with like a 12 inch hole. That way I'll stand a chance. <laughs> same bags, though. Same bags. <laughs> hey, back in the day, 10 years ago, I remember going to a tournament where somebody hand carved that hole. It was about 50% bigger than it should have been. Like, yeah. <laughs> like toilet seat. I, so- I ain't missing. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we had a local builder one time. Well, I know. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and throw myself under the bus here. I used to make boards, and when I started, they weren't that great. Um, I was learning, and uh, I made one. Everybody called it the toilet seat <laughs> because I used uh, the router. <laughs> when I routed the inside of the hole, I didn't have the measurements right, and I had it, like, way too low. And, yeah, it was definitely smooth, but the hole looked like it was about eight inches <laughs> diameter the toilet seat yeah 
<laughs> Good times, man. Bringing That's back so all awesome. these great memories. Good days. <laughs> Dave, what uh, what do you see? So, for your future, do you see this uh, that data data analysis? And there it goes, it's going red again. I can see it. Uh, you're still data nice. analysis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in in the future for the ACL. Oh yeah, I mean, the more the more we collect, the more we need to kind of dig in and see what we got. And you put it to good use, so. Like, just like just like cornhole, I think we're just scratching the surface with what we can do with the the information. And I'm working on some other things in the background that hopefully we get to this year that can, you know, make everything a little bit better. But I'm not gonna not gonna drop any hints yet. But oh come on, man! Things. Right now, drop some bombs <laughs> on the, on the sticky side. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it. it fits though because you know this this uh. ACL gigs of my part-time gig, right? So I work mm. a full-time job. Fortunately, I've been working from home ever since COVID started. And so I work, I go grab some meals. I go grab a meal. I take my kids to wherever they need to get to for dance or whatever. And then I come home and dig through some data for a couple hours most nights. It might not sound that exciting, but I, I enjoy it. <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a data digger myself. I'm a fool for spreadsheets. I love making spreadsheets. Like you want to get nerdy, get an energy drink, sit at your computer and go to YouTube university and just search for different formulas for spreadsheets. I love that. I love it. Oh yeah. Laura's looking at me like, what the hell? You got you a winner, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, look, you can do some serious stuff with spreadsheets, man, if you got patience. I have never seen this man in a spreadsheet in the same room at the same time. <laughs> well, if you, like, minimize the screen, you'll see all the spreadsheets. Especially, I just created, like, two. But don't do it, because you might not go back to the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got, like, five up right now on reports. I mean, look, we've, we've recorded 3.7 million rounds of cornhole so far since... October first. <laughs> oh my uh, god! Three point seven million. <laughs> yeah, and that's right. not even all the ones that were thrown. That's what's awesome. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, that's just that's just the ones entered in the bag tracker. <laughs> well, aren't that's all the awesome? Aren't all your regional directors? Shouldn't they like have to use tablets to report their stats? Uh, because of the investment, it's not required yet. It's just highly encouraged. Yeah. Um. They're, they are being asked to use the, you know, our system to for registrations and wallet for regionals and higher um, now. But as far as capturing rounds, it's, it's not required yet because obviously, depending on how big your regional is, you know, investing in 15 tablets and, you know, whatever else you need to get the Wi-Fi to work, things like that is quite an investment. So well, it seems like at some point that might be required, but it's not yet. Yeah, if if PPR, do you see that? Do you see, go ahead. Sorry. Whoosh, wah, yeah. Break my out <laughs> on you. No, I was just going to say. <laughs> um, I was just going to say if PPR is going to be like one of the main stats that's going to like separate these players and the divisions and stuff, and it's going to like create a tier of players like who the best players are. It seems like that would be mandatory because PPR is a stat that's driven off of the tablets. That's right? that's why it will be eventually, yeah. but. It's not. It's not. Do you there see yet. the league it's... helping? You know, helping directors in that regard. I mean, because now with with the amount of players playing, you know, way back in the day, it was a sixty mile radius for regional directors, but with the amount of players playing today, you know, forty miles down the road, you could have a whole other group of players, you know, doing the same thing and and have a need for another regional director. So. Do you see the league coming in and maybe figuring out a way to help, uh, you know, a regional director get off, you know, get get started? I mean, I mean, equipment, just like you said, the equipment for that is just it, it gets more and more expensive as the commodities get more expensive, you know, for a set of boards now, you know, buying plywood and whatever one buys or two buys is is getting unbelievably expensive and it's just wood. And so the technology as well is getting expensive. What, what does the league have a plan for that? 
I mean, that, I mean, there could be something that I haven't heard about, but my, my theory is, you know, if you go and run good events and you're now an ACL regional director, your events are going to get to the point if they're not already where you're drawing a pretty good crowd. And if you're drawing a pretty good crowd, then you're, you're getting paid for your time and then some, and if you're getting paid for your time and then some, you can make it better by investing some of that that's coming in back into your business by buying tablets, which yes, that's a one-time expensive investment, but it's not like you can't use those tablets for years to come, you know? So it's, it's an investment into years to come that I think, uh, if regional directors aren't doing it yet, which some aren't, uh, they should start considering it. I mean, probably going to become mandatory at some point, but I don't know when, when that will be. Yeah, I've seen some of those smaller tablets. I mean, they're really not that expensive. That Well, it depends on what you call expensive. They're like $40 a piece. And at a regional level, you probably only need like, I don't know, eight of them maybe. Maybe not even that. Like, I don't know. You might have big time regionals. So I don't know how many courts you have, but back in my day when I was running, it would be like <laughs> four or five. So, I mean, I need fourteen at mine. So I've been I've been using fourteen sets of boards for three different divisions, yeah. um, and I'm only getting about a hundred and thirty to hundred and thirty five people. Only, yeah. only about a hundred and thirty. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this: because yeah. back in the day when I was running them, and I know things have changed, so I, I apologize for keep saying back in the day, but like I was giving out some of the, I, I would keep maybe fifty bucks. All right. I wasn't trying to get rich off of running tournaments, uh, and then I would give the rest back to the players. Um, now, how does that work with regional directors now in the ACL? Um, where does the money go for the entrance to the regionals? Is that going to the regional directors or does that go to the ACL or to the players? Everywhere. All, all those Both. places. Yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm just going to say what you're going to say. I mean, the regional yeah. directors pay, pay a fee to be a regional director and then they pay a fee for each regional that they run to the ACL. Um, then they pay out winnings. Uh, it's more optional. There's, there's some, I mean, directors have some freedom as to how they pay the payout at the regional level. So it might vary from area to area, but they pay it out and then they're making money for their time just like they should. And they're, you know, they're probably renting a facility. They got to pay a facility to be there. So there's, there's money going in all, all different directions that are coming in. Yeah. Now, as you can imagine, to get 14 boards in a facility, you're not able to, to rent the local moose lodge anymore you know what i mean you're not you're not doing this on four to six sets of boards anymore like we were able to back in the day i mean truly back in the day i would run some five board regionals and still be able to get them done in a a very uh positive amount of time i don't know what do you want to call it <laughs> efficient hmm. amount of time but these days i'm running i start about nine and probably get out of there about nine and like I said, about 135 people in, in 14 sets. Sorry. I was over there looking at Laura for a second. <laughs> <It's about fucking laughs> I would do that. Time. Oh, gosh, language. There's I kids. Would, I would do that for minutes, <laughs> minutes on end. I wouldn't do that for just a second. I can tell you that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> to be fair, he really wasn't looking can at you... me. He was looking at the computer screen. And she just happened to be over in that. Right. That it's got a nice spreadsheet, nice spreadsheet pulled up on it. <laughs> I assure you, there is not a single spreadsheet to be seen here. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you, That's I can amazing. make some formulas. You know, sum equals uh, 13, comma, that row 13. You don't know how to do all this stuff. Oh, here don't we challenge go. me. You're doing great, kid. Here we yeah. go. Here we go. <laughs> oh, here we go. well, on, we go. Uh, Rob, you got anything else, man? No, nah, man, I just want to thank Dave for taking some time out. I know he's busy and uh, there's some data analysis that didn't get done since we had him on here, but I really appreciate what you do. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for all of us that are on that regional level and the, and the state level to keep these players in line. Uh, but it is a grind and I appreciate what you do for us ever, ever since the day I met you, I've appreciated you. And I just want to thank you again. Appreciate that. We're just scratching the surface. It's only going to get better. Now, uh, Dave, um, I'll just piggyback on Rob. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Um, uh, being one of our directors for Directors Month, 
good talking to you again after seven years, man. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't wait so long next time. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I'll get to see you at, uh, I, at the way it's looking right now because I was supposed to go to Florida and play this past weekend, and I just, uh, you know – the walls fall down, and I can't plan anything right now. Rob, how, how did you finish, actually? I was going to ask you. I uh, uh, So we do rounders, and we went three and three, but and they took some three and threes to tier one, but we, we snuck into tier two. But we were, uh, we were a high-level tier two players, but uh, we ended up three and two in the bracket. Um, and then uh, singles day came around, and it's almost like I was – a brand new thrower again and uh didn't, didn't fare as well as i wanted to but there's another open coming and and i'll be there too <laughs> <laughs> where's the next one at next one will be in kentucky i don't know if i'm going to go to the one in kentucky but we've got uh a six six or seven more coming uh down the pipe so we'll, well see how it goes i do know i'm going to the one in arizona i definitely want to do that one so yeah, gonna book it. Red, yeah, we're gonna do that to, open. the week out there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like Dave. He's selling it. <laughs> I'm uh, getting hey, on it's it. My now. guy. <laughs> it's not. It's not even that. You know, yeah. like I think Kentucky's sold out. So Ooh. if it sells out, you're out of luck. If you really want to go, yeah. so don't wait. Uh, yeah, uh, I've been. To Kentucky I may just go up there as a as a vendor because that when you play and and do your booth because that's what I did. I made a mistake of playing and doing my booth in Florida. And when you do both, it, when you're away from your booth, dude, you, you, you see people walking over there and looking at stuff. And, and from where you're playing, you're like, oh, shit, nobody's there. You know, you're trying to throw your bags at the same time. Somebody. So I, I found myself putting my back <laughs> to my booth when I was playing so that I wouldn't look. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's just, you, you you know, you're losing, you know, you're losing that opportunity to, to make any money. So and when somebody's walking away with a set this. of board men bags. No, I only put three out. I've, 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 uh, I've conquered that. Oh, okay. I only put three out. <laughs> yep. oh. They have walked away before, so oh, yeah. I've conquered that. Well, Dave, thanks again, man. Um, we're going to let you go. We appreciate you being on the sticky side, and uh, maybe we'll see you out there. Maybe I know Rob will, but maybe I'll get to see you out there uh, sometime in 2022 at ACL event, brother. You have a good one Sounds out there good. in Cleveland, and stay safe. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right, Rob, we'll see, see you, later, you on, the, on the next show, brother. You be good in Florida, man. Thank you, Mike. All see right. you next time. This is Mike. That's Rob. And this is Sticky Side. We'll see you next time. Throw them straight. Peace. Because we all just want to be corn hoes, southern singing, deep throat, seldom driving beat up cars. The crowd get crazy and the beers ain't cheap. We get drunk all day, so we just don't eat and we hang out at the mofa bar, throwing bags in the hole like we have it all.